Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q3 FY24 earnings conference call of Computer Age Management Services Limited hosted by Orient Capital. With us today we have Mr. Anuj Kumar, Managing Director, Mr. Ram Charan SR, CFO and Mr. Anish Savlani, Head Investor Relations. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Shivani Karvat from Orient Capital. Thank you and over to you ma'am. Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Q3 FY24 earnings conference call for Computer Age Management Services Limited. Before we proceed to the call, I would like to give a small disclaimer that this conference call will contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on beliefs, opinions and expectations of the company as on date. These statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve risks and uncertainties which are difficult to predict. A detailed disclaimer has also been published in the investor presentation which was released to the top exchanges. I hope everybody had a chance to go through the presentation. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Anuj Kumar, Managing Director. Thanks everyone and over to you sir. Hi, good morning everyone and thank you Shivani. Uh, good morning to everyone who joined this uh, 3Q earnings call of CAM. I appreciate you taking your time out. Uh, we will follow the standard format uh, for this call, which means that uh, there is a structured presentation. I'll take you through that. Seven or eight slides. Uh, hand over to Ramcharan for uh, his commentary on financials. And then we should have about 20 to 25 minutes uh, available for taking Q&A. Uh, so I will begin. And... Uh, on the charts, if you uh, if you downloaded the pack, this is chart number six. Uh, I'll start by sharing with you that CAMS has won the major fund RTE mandate of uh, Unify Capital. As you know, Unify is a very prominent uh, uh, PMS provider based in Chennai and has aspirations to operate a mutual fund. They were one of those 10 or 11 um, entities which had applied for a license in the last about 18 months. So very happy to share with you that uh, this is uh, recently got announced and adds to the set of uh, significant and marquee new logo wins in the mutual fund arena in the last um, 18 to 24 month period. So this makes it the fifth of the last seven new mutual fund mandates which have been declared in the market. Uh, overall, from an AUM perspective, you are aware that uh, we scaled significantly during the uh, uh, last nine months, <coughs> and uh, mutual fund assets stand at about just short of uh, 34 trillion, 33.95. Uh, this is a 22% growth year on year. You would have seen in the release. Uh, our overall market share stands at 68.2. Uh, what is significantly heartening is that uh, equity AUM has scaled uh, much faster which means it has scaled ahead of the market and it has scaled ahead of our normal base growth. This now stands at 16.9 trillion. It has registered a 31% growth and when you compare it uh, with the rest of the industry growth, uh, equity AUM to our equity AUM growth, uh, the 31 is significantly ahead of the 24% that the industry has achieved. Uh, from a market share perspective, equity AUM market share, we grew by 140 basis points on an annual basis and about 40 basis points quarter on quarter uh, to touch 66. So you know that this number has been creeping up steadily for the last about two and a half to three years, but at 66% is a uh, fairly significant number to quote. Also, <coughs> I'm sorry, you are aware that uh, SIP collections and SIP registrations are really uh, the formative element which are driving the growth of this market from a SIP live book perspective which basically covers the count of SIPs that we have. This grew 29% year on year. Again, at a significant delta, uh, industry grew by 19%, we grew by 29%, and as you're aware, 
that this really adds heft to monthly collections, net sales, AUM growth and all of that. So again, a fairly foundational number to continue watching and as I come to collection numbers etc., you will see how this number of SIP registrations and live book are really influencing asset numbers. Also the fact that of the, I quoted five out of seven wins, out of those five wins, uh, Helios Mutual Fund and Zerodha both went live during the quarter. And again, in a fairly, you know, racing away towards the finish line, uh, Helios grew to about uh, very close to a 1,000 crore AUM number. Now, you know that for a new mutual fund to grow to a 1,000 crore, it sometimes takes years, uh, not just one year, but sometimes even longer than that. So, for them to achieve this uh, in a short while again, a fairly significant milestone from an achievement perspective. Uh, both these mutual funds went live uh, during the quarter. Uh, if I move a little to beyond mutual funds, which is the non-mutual fund businesses, uh, you are aware that we've had a sustained focus on expanding share of non-MF in the overall book. And also we've stated to you that we will continue scaling non-MF uh, at a rate ahead of the MF book. Again, very happy to share with you that um, year on year, this has grown about 3.3%, so 330 basis points. Uh, share of non-MF is in the range of 13% now. Uh, what comprises non-MF and what is significantly scaled? One, of course, is alternatives. And I'll talk about alternatives as we move forward, but at a broad bullet level, uh, grew 21% year on year. Added uh, significantly large number of new mandates, which is uh, 32. This includes four in gift cities, so again, from a, a market win perspective, a very satisfying quarter across all respects. Uh, the other business, which has done extremely well and where we have uh, sharpened our offering and also sharpened our go-to-market route, is, uh, is Camps KRA, where you've seen that we've declared over 100% revenue growth at 129%. Uh, from an entity which used to largely cater to CAM service mutual funds. We've gone to beyond CAM service mutual funds across all, all of them. But not that alone. Uh, you know, from a fintech, brokerage, uh, wealth advisory perspective, all these entities uh, need KYC and KRA services, and CAM's KRA has, uh, has brought in a large number of customers in the last 12 months to both broaden out clientele and scale revenue which is why you see that uh, it's on a smaller base, but that notwithstanding, the revenue average growth over 100% uh, in the year, uh, in the quarter year on year, is a very, very significant uh, achievement. Uh, moving forward from, a, uh, from an insurance repository perspective, uh, we have declared that CAMP's rep has gained entry, and you know that uh, the non-life segment also now has uh, KYC uh, as a mandatory step before you purchase insurance. Uh, so we've won a mandate from Oracle Insurance to do uh, KYC for them, digital KYC. This is a joint go-to-market and a joint offering between CAMP's rep and Think360. As you know, Think360 has had this product called Quick ID, which was selling quite well in the financial services, which is NBFC and banking arena. But this is a nice entry into insurance, so that's what CAMS Rep is one. And also very pleased to share with you that uh, just broadening out the business for CAMS Pay, uh, we have won an exclusive partner status from LIC uh, to execute customer account authentication. This is largely third-party verification of accounts of uh, people who wanted to buy insurance and are stepping in digitally. But again, uh, uh, fairly happy contract and it's an exclusive partnership. Uh, riding on all these wins and uh, all the tailwinds that we have faced uh, from a uh, SIP growth, MF, AUM growth perspective, the financial highlights are uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, camps the overall uh, revenue book grew just short of 19% at 18.9. Within this, MF revenue grew 14.6% year on year. Non-MF grew a staggering 59% uh, year on year. If I take up the effect of uh, Think360, which is still a one-time addition to the book, we still grew about 41% year on year on a uh, non-MF basis. 
four out of the six non-MF businesses grew by more than 20 percent. So that's a significant achievement. Uh, four of the six growing by over 20 percent. Riding on the revenue growth, uh, EBITDA grew 19.7 percent year on year. EBITDA percentage is historically at the highest. You would remember a number of uh, 44.5 in the last quarter. And a year back, that number scaled up to 44.8, so it's about 30 basis points up. And profit after tax grew in absolute terms 21%, in percentage terms grew 40 basis points up year on year. So that's a very solid set of financial metrics, just riding on uh, strong sales and operating performance uh, almost across the board. Uh, I will move forward. Uh, you would have, uh, uh, once you've downloaded the pack, you would have seen that uh, there is uh, significant financial data. I will just cover chart number seven. And then what is there on 8, 9, 10, 11, I will leave it to you uh, for reading. But on chart uh, number eight, you would see that uh, we saw historic highs in transactions. And uh, there was a continuing lift in uh, SIP numbers, equity AUM, and new investor count, uh, all of which, like you know, are foundational metric. And our overall SIP registration was a lifetime high of 43.9 million. So broadly, a 9% uh, transaction volume growth, uh, growing from uh, just short of 141 million to 153, uh, vindicating all the activity which is happening in the market. Uh, equity EVM, like I said, grew significantly ahead of RBS growth and uh, the market growth of equities so grew 31%. Um, equity AUM from 20, from 12.9 in uh, uh, last year's third quarter to 16.9 now. Uh, equity net sales, uh, which is a good measure of what is the uh, fraction of net sales coming to us uh, through camp service funds was uh, in, in 3Q23 was 73.2%, still holding quite well at 72%, uh, absolute growth of 26 but holding share. And uh, like I said, our equity, uh, AUO market share is 66, so long as the net sales share is uh, 5 or 6% ahead of that, it simply means that um, equity AUO share will continue to grow, so that's a good number. Uh, SIP registrations, uh, new SIPs, we crossed the highest single month number, of 2.5 million, 25 lakh SIPs were registered in December of 23. And from a SIP registration perspective, uh, we were at a 61.8% uh, market share in 2Q, which uh, grew up slightly by a small margin to 62, but still holding up quite well. Uh, live SIPs, you know, net of cancellations in 3Q, this number was 3.3 million, uh, which is again the highest ever and again boards very well for future collections and future uh, SIP related growth. Uh, 2Q, the absolute number of uh, live SIPs was 40.5 million, like I said, grew to 43.9 in this quarter. And then SIP gross sales, which is a number you end up reading about every month as the releases come out, uh, was uh, 283 billion in the second quarter grew to about 312 billion, so it's crossed um, what is a magical number of 10,000 crore a month and is heading in the direction of 11. And from a market share perspective, SIP gross sales was uh, just over 60% in 2Q and has scaled uh, to 60.5, so grew about 0.4%. So all of those are nice growth numbers to continue backing us uh, in the story beyond this quarter. And like I said, they are all foundational numbers which will perhaps continue defining growth uh, as we move forward. After these two, I'm just uh, skipping chart number 8, 9, 10, and 11, assuming that uh, you have a copy and you would have gone through it. I will take you through uh, individual businesses, just uh, chart by chart, maybe about a minute on each, uh, starting with alternatives where uh, we are reporting a revenue growth of 21% year on year. I spoke about uh, 32 new wins uh, during the quarter, which is a very sustained new logo onboarding performance. CAMP's WellServe uh, continues to herald the uh, digitization uh, you know, momentum in this industry and has over 110 sign-ups. Uh, there is now enough trend to see that over 30%, in some places 40% of new customers 
in AI and PMS are coming through the digital world. So that's uh, just revolutionizing the way onboarding happens in this uh, in this asset class. Um, in Give City, we now have uh, over 15 clients. We added four new during the quarter. And then uh, with multi fonts, because we brought in the multi country, multi currency fund accounting capability, moving some of the existing and new clients onto that platform just to gain experience and gain help uh, in that class. Also, from a Pintuple perspective, you know that Pintuple has been building these large uh, uh, platforms uh, connecting custody programs of large banks uh, with domestic PMSs and then followed by domestic AIS. The first of these programs has, uh, with a very large bank, has just gone into life. Uh, they are onboarding the EMS, EMCs now onto the platform. And uh, all of this is now growing beyond just uh, uh, AIS and PMS and is growing into things like SPI, Forex, and Treasury Services. So, Fintuple has been able to, although it's taken them some time, has been able to build these bespoke platforms which have uh, multiple components of uh, assisting large custodies to integrate with FBIs, to integrate with EIS and PMSs. And we believe that the offtake in terms of onboarding will now start building momentum. Also, overall, uh, we've declared a 2.2 trillion asset under service for our alternative sponsor. From a from a camps pay perspective, I spoke about uh, LIC onboarding camps pay as an exclusive partner to execute uh, customer authentication services. Camps pay registered uh, uh, strong revenue growth uh, year on year. Uh, onboarded uh, significant number of uh, new clients for UPI auto pay. UPI auto pay is now uh, emerging as a preferred mode. It has uh, got significant. Uh, uh, strength and uh, just quality is over the traditional NAT and E-NAT, uh, so that uh, portfolio continues to grow. And from an overall uh, volumes and revenue perspective, it's been a, a strong quarter of the camp space. Uh, I'll go to the next, uh, which is Camps KRA. Uh, this, we have said, has uh, uh, performed, uh, I mean, has delivered a very strong performance, uh, growing over 100% uh, uh, during the quarter over last year. Uh, you would have seen um, enough uh, news and PR around our 10-minute KYC, which I think is uh, the foundational component which has helped us uh, uh, penetrate brokerages and fintechs. So, a large component of new pants, or uh, which is really the, the gunpowder that a KRA survives on, have started coming from uh, all these other sectors uh, outside of uh, domestic mutual funds. Also, from an EI embedded offering perspective with uh, assisted face match, OCR, liveliness check, liveliness APIs, etc., we are finding that um, CAMS KRA is now getting accepted across the board as a superior product in the marketplace, and the growth then just vindicates all of that. Uh, there are 25 new financial institutions of various colors, hues, and types which have uh, which have now commenced business with us, which have signed up. And the onboarding journey now, the front end of the journey is powered by Think's uh, Quick ID. So that's a product which has earned its spurs across banks and NVFCs. Now we are using it as a standard uh, uh, front end onboarding journey, while Camp KRA then provides uh, all the backend services uh, that a KRA works. Going to the next on CAMS Rep, uh, we spoke about CAMS Rep's entry into uh, KYC and of uh, the win with parental insurance to do all the execute the entire digital KYC process uh, through CAMS Rep. Uh, this again is powered through things uh, Quick ID. Also, from a BIMA central perspective, although progress uh, isn't as fast as we had expected, the first few uh, insurance companies are now fully integrated onto the BIMA Central program. And uh, this, this app is now available in the App Store and the Play Store, and this is something you can try. 
from a eia perspective we continue to maintain a market share of 39% for policies and 31% on the eia ka um as i move forward i am on chart number 16 on camps filter uh, we show a sustained expansion in market share you would have seen that we have started with single digits and now happy to share with you that we have grown to over 30% uh, uh, in the a ecosystem in terms of share uh, we are the preferred uh, a partner when the account aggregator thing started very few people expected that things like uh, fno account opening will become a large use case uh, we are now the preferred partners in the industry so we're seeing multiple number of brokerages uh, for this particular use case where a bank account has to be refreshed every year Uh, for all live fno accounts uh, 25 fiu clients were live uh, in 3q and then we continue to report a number of new deals both from an a and dsp perspective so a solid quarter still small revenue but uh, from a market share total number of pulls uh, penetrating various segments demonstrating new use cases of things like fno and now personal finance management i think a very satisfying uh, period for the team i will move forward from a think 360 perspective you will remember that we had declared that for the flagship product which is algo 360 we had signed a deal with uh, sbi car uh, that uh, engagement is now live which means usage will begun and this is a very marquee customer uh, for usage of this product so we expecting Uh, scale dynamics to now continue showing as time progresses <coughs> similarly from a digitalization perspective we now have contracts with uh, three of the top 10 public sector banks in india for uh, overall digitalization this was largely the digital kyc journey um, this is now fully signed up with canara bank too uh we one uh, these are both uh, analytics and risk management contracts uh, one with credit access grammy and the other with dcb for uh, augmenting the overall risk analytics expertise camps and uh, think 360 have also built a product called fluence 360 which is a, a geographic data product which helps businesses strategize in terms of understanding buying power of their consumers and how the consumers are dispersed across cities and pin codes so that product is now ready for the market and lastly i will talk about uh, camp cps uh, we've seen a 2x growth in overall subscriber count uh, year on year Uh, we continue to hold the number 2 position in overall new eaps sales um our uh, overall innovations in terms of uh, making the cash enabled uh, upi auto pay all of those things uh, continue to be uh, playing out in the market and then from a pop perspective now uh, uh, we are linked with several pops and almost uh, three fourths of the overall traffic is now getting contributed by these for you as you know is uh, this season for nps so we expecting to uh, continue broadening out and uh, expanding the numbers as far as nps is concerned so i will pause here uh, hand it over to ramcharan for his commentary on financials and then once we are done then we will take questions thank you anuj um uh, the financials uh, which touched upon the highlights in the in the earlier part of the presentation i have just tried to get into one level detail of this uh from a revenue uh, as indicated we have kind of had a strong revenue growth during the quarter uh, 18.9% year on year at the back of uh, a growth in assets and the mutual fund revenue the mutual fund revenue uh, grew by uh, 15% almost 14.6% again on the back of growth in assets uh on a quarter on quarter basis our revenue grew by 5.3% uh the and from mutual fund uh, on a quarter on quarter grew 5.4% uh which is again they, they, uh, again backed by uh, high growth in the aum uh this is actually a good pointer to us if you remember over the last few quarters we have been indicating 
that from a yield pressure perspective, which was a common question from a lot of people, uh, you know, that uh, the one-time reset of the yield, one-time large reset of the yields with one of our major customers has been completed. You will see the impact of this in the next few quarters. I have to say that it's played out like that in this quarter, and you will see any uh, yield compression in this quarter, and thanks to the equity mix being favorable, uh, the equity mix for CAMS is 50% almost, 49.9%. We are, in fact, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis seeing a very, very marginal increase in yields, you know, which is, again, playing out the way that we anticipated. And going forward, uh, we also do not see any large depletion yields other than what will be driven by the telescopic pricing. So uh, from a revenue perspective, as uh, asset-based revenue, which is a major part of the mutual fund revenue, grew 13.2% year-on-year and a 5.1% quarter-on-quarter, and this is a 212 crores of asset-based revenue. Uh, the non-asset based revenue on the back of uh, good climb up in transaction revenue as well as uh, miscellaneous and applications value added that we sell to our customers uh, both had a very smart uh, growth rate so which means on a year on year basis we grew 20, 23% and on a quarter on quarter by a 7% so our non-asset based revenue is currently at 40.8 crores uh, so 212 and 40.8 crores the overall MF revenue stands at 252 crores for the quarter again up almost 15%. The non-MF revenue, I think the earlier slides were uh, kind of getting into the detail of individual business lines that we have, but the highlight is being that we continue to deliver on non-MF growth, which we had kind of projected. Uh, a, a, a big increase of around 60% is what you saw on a year-on-year -year basis of non-MF revenue, which includes the revenue of Think Analytics, which you acquired at the beginning of this year. Even keeping that aside, the overall revenue growth is upwards of 40%, which is again uh, tracking to our entire projection of you know getting the non-MF revenue to a 20% of the overall revenue within the next few years. We are well on track to achieving that. Uh, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, too, the uh, the non-MF revenue grew by 4.5%. The individual conference, Anuj touched upon in the earlier slides, uh, good growth on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis uh, on an AAF, on a payment perspective. KRA grew more than 100 percentage and the AA TSP. So we had four businesses which grew more than 20 percent quarter on quarter with KRA doing very well with more than 100 percent growth uh, you know, when compared to last year the same quarter. So uh, all in all a very strong revenue growth of almost 19 percentage driven by growth in MF uh, as well as in the non-MF statements uh, which again leads to our profitability. Uh, we over the last uh, uh, seven quarters this has been kind of the highest profitability that we have seen. An operating EBITDA, we ended the quarter with almost 130 crore, 129.6 crores of operating EBITDA, which is, a eight, which is an almost 20%, 19.7% growth over the same quarter last year. And sequentially, uh, it was a growth of almost 6%, 5.8% growth. Uh, the margins crept up again, as we had indicated, you know, as and when the uh, revenue starts going into the non-MF, as well as the amount of operating leverage. We will have an operating EBITDA creep up, which has again played out in the current quarter too. Uh, as opposed to 44.5% in the earlier quarter, we are at a 44.8% operating EBITDA. Uh, PBT is in line with it, it's almost at 40%, 39.9%, and PAT, uh, we entered the quarter with a 89.29 crores of PAT and a 29.8%, uh, good growth of 21% in PAT on a year on year basis and a 5.7% quarter on quarter. As I said, uh, if you take the last seven quarters, this is the highest margins that we have seen, not only in terms of absolute numbers, but even in terms of margin percentages, which again indicates to a very strong financial performance. Uh, on the return on network, as I uh, you know we are used to the 40% kind of uh, return on network, which we are continuing to see, uh, and we enter the quarter with a healthy cash and cash equivalent surplus of around 580 crores in our balance sheet. Uh, the one uh, one item on the cost that we would like to highlight is uh, the cost, comparable cost for this year. Uh, just like we eliminated the revenue for Think, there's a comparable cost of almost 5 crores for the year. And hence, you would see some increase in the individual expenses. Uh, but that that is the one time, that is, that is the inclusion of Think for the first time in our consolidated financials. And also, we had uh, the final tranche of the current ESOP scheme rolled out during the quarter. So you had a non-cash charge uh, of around 4.3 crores that is coming into the current quarter books, which was 1.7 crores more than what it was in the last quarter. So if you see overall from an expense creep perspective, uh, if you if you consider the non-cash charge of ESOP of 1.7 crores, and if you consider there is an increase in out-of-pocket expenses or OPE, both from a KRA as well as the MF perspective to the extent of 2.5 crores, the expense growth quarter on quarter has been extremely muted. 
which is uh, the reason, which is the reason why you see uh, some amount of uh, creep up in the margins. Uh, that is also playing out on a year-on-year -year basis. Year-on-year -year basis, uh, you had uh, the, uh, the the OPE expenses grow by almost five crores. Uh, you know, if you actually take that out, you will see a strong transmission of the increase in top line to the bottom line. Uh, that's the uh, broad commentary on the financials. I will now hand it back to Tushar, and he may open it for Q and A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Supra, Supratim Dutta from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. So my first question is, you know, you, you take some color on how costs have tracked in this uh, uh, quarter. But just if you could give us a split between, you know, the cost, how much of that is for the uh, core MFRP business and how much is for the non ms business, that would also help us understand you know, how the profit is on you know, the profitability is tracking in the, those two segments. Uh, that would be one of the questions. The other question is on the KRA business. You indicated that you have, you know, entered into 25 uh, new uh, you know, relationships with FinTech. Now, I wanted to understand that, you know, what is driving your, you know, this ability to enter into these new relationships with FinTechs. Uh, is it a product a differentiation that is helping you here? Because from a KYC record perspective, you are still significantly lower than the market leader. So, wanted to understand what's your, uh, you know, differentiation. Those are the two questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, there are two cost route. I will take the first part on the uh, non-MF uh, profitability expense, and then Anuj will uh, come in on the KRA and what's happening in that uh, for us to grow this much. See, uh, I, I will give you broad guidelines in terms of how the non-MF uh, has used, and we had indicated in the earlier quarters too, you know, from an investment perspective, uh, we are investing in uh, Bima Central, which is the uh, CAMS rep uh, new platform. We are investing in the AA DSP. We are, interesting, we are investing in the CRA platform. And uh, we are also kind of trying to continue to make enhancements uh, from a payments platform perspective. And AAF, we are launching new products. So what we had indicated was in the last year that the investments that we are making, and uh, we do not kind of capitalize or amortize. We kind of take most of it to the tender. Uh, on a on a quarter on quarter basis, our spend was projected to be three or four crores. So for the current year, for all these initiatives put together, uh, we have spent more than five crores. Okay. Now what has changed is the top line growth. So what used to be a very minimal, less than uh, you know, very small revenue component from AA TSP is now almost tracking to 70 lakhs a quarter. What is happening from an MS Central perspective is tracking to almost 60 to 70 lakhs a quarter. Uh, you know, uh, so things like that are AAF, you know, is growing 21% and a lot of it is because of the uh, new ramp up that's happening on the products, right? So from a cost perspective, I don't think it's very different from what it was in earlier quarters. We continue to spend around 5 6 crores on the on these platforms that we are building out. Uh, but the revenue has crept up, which means that the uh, profitability from a non-MF perspective, uh, considering it, it's, it's not a homogeneous bucket, but just from an easier to understand perspective, if you take the bucket of non-MF business, the profitability has crept up, and it will be in these high single digits, high, high double digits, so less than 10. So it will be around 10 to 15 percentage of the uh, bucket profitability, which is higher than what it was in the earlier quarter. And as we get more and more revenue from a top line perspective, this will kind of get closer to the profitability. That's, that's basically the understanding that we have. Whether it will happen in two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, it's how, how fast the revenue will ramp up. But that's, that's the trajectory that we are forcing. On the KRA perspective, uh, yes, sir. so uh, when you look at the KRA business, think of it as uh, it serves the entire capital market. In the capital market, the large participants are brokerages and depositories who you know that uh, they add customers at a pace which is significantly ahead of what the mutual funds add uh, new customers at. Uh, historically, we had rooted this business and designed it to serve cab service mutual funds. So a subset of the total. 
in the last year and a half uh, especially after we brought in navi as a customer we have now been uh, going after the entire stack of mutual funds but also uh large brokerages and large fintechs some of these fintechs are selling mutual funds a lot of them are just registered brokers so we have expanded the game to let's say uh, the playing arena is 3 or 4x of what it used to be and within the brokerage business as you know there are significant lumps there are five or six entities which are very large and then there is a uh there there is a medium sized set of entities and there's a long tail so as you go after these and you just can't go after these through a sales effort because your product and your overall servicing turnaround times quality of onboarding time taken etc has to be world class we have built all of that which is why we are seeing gain in share now are we going to become the number one very quickly the answer is no because it takes a period of time the delta between the number 1 and number 2 today is significant there is an incumbent number 1 but what i can certainly assure you on is that this is not a flash in the pan performance we've grown revenue 100% on the back of onboarding new pan when these investor pans are reused either in the mf market or through you know for brokerages of opening dmat accounts that is really revenue creative so we are doing the right foundational things for the business this year's revenue growth is one indication but my expectation is that you will continue to see this sustained in the same manner you will see the gap lessening between the leader and us uh, when do we scale up to really challenge the leader etc that may take some time but i think the initial metrics of onboarding high potential customers expanding the number of pans uh, in our armory and being able to sell them to reflect in revenue i think those are great momentum causing events which have happened in the last 4 to 5 quarters got it that's the end just to follow up on another first question on investing uh, so you know on the non uh, mf side i understand you are spending five six crore additionally you know for some of the initiatives that in the state now going forward should we continue to see this new investment So if I may ask, uh, can you just repeat the question? And uh, you know, if, uh, because the I, I did not, I was not able to read you fully because the voice was not very clear. Is your question on yield, or if you can please repeat it for us? Yeah, yeah. So I will on the just this is follow up on the first question. So on the investment, uh, so you said five six crores towards new initiatives. Just wanted to understand how should we think of it going forward? Should it continue at this level, and what would be those initiatives that you would be spending on uh, the spice of school? And on the MS side, if you could list, you know, how are thinking about investments? What would be some of the things that you would be investing in on the MS side? That that would be my question. Thank you. Thank. Uh, so uh, what we have uh, kind of said consistently, and we continue following, is that the investment amount would not go down. you know while this is a journey this is not uh, we have not reached the destination in terms of where we want to be in terms of the product so basically we will continue to invest in new products in aif we already have rolled out the onboarding platform we are doing the wealth track and we are doing the fund accounting platform similarly from other businesses the cra platform will get further embellished you know we are doing various journeys on that we will get uh, you know uh, we have started the pop we will get the government in and uh, other other schemes and flavors into it Uh, and from a uh, aapsp it's, it's several use cases are emerging uh, you know we are we taking a lot of these things so uh, the investments in this will not slow down we will continue to invest this money in the platforms that we are speaking about and we will see the beneficial impact in terms of ramp up in the revenue but uh, you should assume that the same amount will continue to get invested on a quarter on quarter basis adjusted for obviously some inflation and salary costs as we go forward uh, on the second question of uh, investments in mf uh, on what we are doing so uh, like ram said uh, you can't win in the marketplace till you build cutting edge products and till you've taken them to market so sales and product development and some degree of uh, you know just pr and spreading the news around are just natural investment you've said in the past uh, non mf that will be in the range of you know 15 to 20 crore a year which i think continues the point that ram has made is that against that there used to be small offsetting revenue as increasingly the offsetting revenue increases because Uh, those markets are growing you've seen that in kra in aif and in uh, account aggregator definitely uh, we will see that offsetting revenues grow and therefore the uh, 
quantum of the investment remains constant, but it becomes revenue accretive. On the mutual fund side, uh, there is a significant amount of work uh, that we continue to do to, you know, scale up and add leadership, uh, which is of course uh, leadership and, uh, and manpower. But from a, uh, you know, risk, anti-fraud, cyber security, BCP, just the way we treat data and we are able to uh, organize data and, you know, get analytics and insights from them. Those are standard, I would say, now you can count them as a run rate investment. They're inside the P&L. They continue to happen all the time. Uh, the sophistication that we need, let's say, from a security perspective, continues to scale up um, in this world where you have to guard your perimeter very effectively and make sure there is no intrusion. So that will continue. That's inside the P&L. I don't think uh, you should read it as a separate line, which is, kind of asynchronous to the growth of the business, but asynchronous to the growth of the business, and we'll continue. Did that answer your question? So, I think it's disconnected. We'll move on to the next question. No problem. The next question is from the line of Sanket Goda from Avendis Park. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, now, my question is, uh, just if you can give you an indicative number, I mean, since today we are at a beta margin of 44.7, um, if, if, uh, if if I want to split the beta margin of uh, MF and non-MF, um, uh, how uh, how it is, and, and, and as, as Anu's highlighted, if the growth starts picking up in the non-MF business, uh, then how you see... Uh, the, the overall EBITDA margins to play out uh, from, from the current levels or, or we see or, or what the numbers what we are looking at are like peak numbers, uh, significant expansion you don't expect to happen. Uh, just, just some outlook on, on that. And, and second question is, is largely on non-MS revenue. Uh, if, 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 um, if, if, you, if you look at AI business or, or can pay business, uh, it seems to be plateauing on sequential basis, it's around 74, uh, uh, 74, 75 million rupees, and even camps pay. Uh, just, just wanted to understand how to see these numbers uh, to to uh, pan out. Uh, uh, though on on year on year basis, this looks healthy, but but on sequential basis, it seems to be holding up at those numbers. Just if you can view a little better outlook on on these businesses, will will be helpful. And and lastly, on on fund accounting. I think your competitor is a little, little aggressive on that particular piece. So, so, so if if you can uh, speak a little, little more on fund accounting as a uh, new source of revenue, how you want to build this, uh, it, it will be great. Oh, uh, got it. So, uh, I'll answer the question on margins first, Ankit, and uh, I think there are three questions that you asked. Uh, I'll just take the margins one first. So, uh, Yes, uh, we have seen a creep up in our non-MF margins, what used to be, uh, you know, even as a single bucket, and I, I would like to clarify again, they are not a homogeneous business or a unit, but for the purpose of ease of understanding, suppose we kind of club them under a single bucket and say it's non-MF bucket, uh, our margins now on an EBITDA perspective are less than 15%, right? What used to be a single digit number has now uh, kind of gone up to close to 15%. On a, this person. And so the MF, uh, MF uh, is, is kind of much more than the 44 percentage that you are finding. Mathematically, that's when your average is 44.8 percentage. Now, going forward, the trajectory, uh, again, this is again consistently what we have been saying for the last few quarters is that we will get the margins of the non MF business creeping up as and when uh, the revenue starts ramping up. Whether it happens rapidly over one or two quarters or over four or five quarters is what the market will tell us. But our trajectory of the non-MF margins, given that the spend is going to be plateauing and the revenue is going to be increasing, we expect that, you know, they will get 10 towards the 25 percentage in a, in a next few quarters for sure, right? Uh, there is no, going to be no dilution in margins average from a peer perspective. Because of some investments, AF margins could come down a little. Uh, but RIP, once the BMA Central starts and some revenue starts kicking in and, uh, and the other AA, TSP businesses and the Sterling software external businesses, uh, could actually give us an incremental 10 percentage increase in margins as we go forward. Uh, so that's the expectations and obviously I would just like to caution you with one thing which is that the April quarter has always traditionally been the quarter in which we have had a close 2.5 percent increase in cost because of the annual appraisal. Now whether that is 2 percent or 3 percent or 2.5 percent and when that will happen is obviously a decision to be taken when we are closer to April. 
but i know the long term trend suggests that the increment on quarter 1 uh, this is across industries not obviously unique to camps is going to be around 2.5 percentage so keeping that in mind i would not uh, kind of predict that our operating ebitda will go to 49 to 50 percentage but what we are confident of doing is see this creep up in the ebitda and if we keep us in the salary increment for a moment to see this ebitda creep up by uh, what we are seeing is 20 30 basis points uh, over the next few quarters for sure so that's the expectation uh, and we will see we, we obviously hope and uh, you know think that the revenue ramps up further we will see a further ramp up in ebitda but i would still not suggest that we will be close to 50 percentage any time soon uh, perfect yeah yeah now yeah Sir, sorry, you have a follow-on on that, or should we go to the next question? I mean, uh, just a, basically, basically, my my simple point is that by my means uh, means is if I include even the uh, annual appraisals uh, um, yeah, in in FI 25, uh, then then uh, you are saying that uh, current current margins can can potentially be be at least at least if if 20 30 basis point improvement in the per, per quarter, uh, then then we can see probably a one percent better margin than than what we can expect in FI 24. Is 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 what I wanted to just check. So you know historically, in some case, you've seen that operating EBITDA has grown by about a percent a year. That is irrespective of the puts and takes, whether we've made investments, whether revenue has grown or not grown at the same pace. So just extrapolating the past into the future, uh, you, you know what to expect, right? With what you said, uh, 30 basis points in the quarter. And the 30 basis point repeat itself in all the four quarters. I think the only point Ram is saying is the first quarter always tough to repeat the act, but uh, we, we are at it and, and expecting about a 1% increase in a year, just from a historical perspective, is uh, is just par for the course, right? It happened for the last four five years. It likely can happen the next year too. Uh, Perfect. 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 On CAMS P and AIS, I think the formatting matter you should look at is uh, what is the pace we are winning at? Are we able to hold our prices? And are we introducing new products into the market? Because if you are doing these three or four things consistently in any marketplace, and in AIS you know that we come from a place of leadership, then it is not uh, it is not tough to expand revenue. You can always have a quarter which may. which may not look the most stratospheric but i would just encourage you to look at the numbers that you shared we said that four of the non mm businesses grew over 20% alternatives on a large base at about 21 uh, pay even higher so a narrow comparison just in terms of overall growth i think is a good number to look at uh, we've shown you that uh, the air business one almost 32 new clients uh look at the scale our digital onboarding now has over 114 customers and these all revenue yielding contracts of course revenue per uh, per sale isn't it's in line with what it used to be in the past so i'm got quite confident that we will continue delivering the uh, growth numbers that we have uh, spoken about in the past for non mf non mf is a lump we want to keep it over 20% and from what i see coming i think there is uh, there is significant confidence that that will continue happening uh, on fund accounting today we service uh, almost 70 to 80 unique consumers uh, from a fund accounting perspective uh, earlier this was done in a certain way three quarters back we decided to bring in the multi fonts platform which is now going into production uh, and about three or four of our clients are going to migrate on that so again uh, very confident that we have uh, the right offering uh, the right go to market strategy and the right teams to continue scaling this uh, that is how i would characterize fund accounting i'm personally very excited with the alternatives business both what uh, the camps team is doing and what the fund tuple team does and collectively collectively between them uh, we are quite positive about the acceptance of the products in the marketplace and how we will scale got it i think sanketa can say major side i think uh, from a af perspective the quarter on quarter growth you know uh, is not bad you know it's i think upwards of 10% if i'm not mistaken so uh, i think uh, uh, the foundational metrics as anu said is is giving i think the number is also decent from a quarter on quarter growth of af got it got it and and and, and last one uh, given given this uh, multi fond platform uh, i'm believing it is built completely in house Uh, so 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 if if we if we uh, try to cross sell to 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 more ais or, or other funds 
then then do you expect uh, the revenue realization from the existing funds i mean you given the cost of opportunity uh, i believe you are largely in pa uh, transfer agency i mean sorry business in ai now now uh, from uh, fund accounting uh, do you see this this will play out uh, Uh, much better than than what we are anticipating, or or the run rate could be a little better because your ability to cross sell. Uh, so cross selling was always happening. Like I said, we have about eighty unique consuming entities mm-hmm. which were buying fund accounting. The gap in the offering was that we did not have multi currency. So think of someone who's trying to you know re domicile themselves from an overseas location into let's say gift city, etc. we did not have multi currency reporting etc multi funds therefore uh, closes out that gap so it is a niche it is a part of the overall fund accounting offering will it uh, create revenue scale of its own the answer is yes will it make us more scalable the answer is yes but from a base perspective that business will continue any domestic uh, pure single currency asset work will continue the way it is continuing Perfect, and and this largely will be catering to AIs, right? Or, or uh, you want to expand this uh, platform beyond AIs? Yeah, right now I think one thing at a time. You know our approach, right? We don't try to spill into 100 places at the same time. One thing at a time. We we want to make it a success. Have a number of marquee customers talking good things about us, and then if you're thinking of pension and MF etc., it's a natural sequel. But uh, we we just want to get it first right in the base uh, amongst the AIs, and then then move forward. Ah, uh, perfect, Anish. Uh, thanks, thanks for the answer. Thank you. And the next question is from the line of Abhijit Sakre from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my first question is uh, coming back to the non-MF businesses. Uh, just putting all of them together, how would you kind of you know characterize the the recurring or annuity nature of revenues versus you know something that is driven by you know volumes or transactions uh if you can kind of give us some sense broad sense on that piece of the business so uh if you are asking whether there is a uh, uh connected to sale or recurring sale component yeah. i would say some of things businesses which are uh, more project based you win a 6 month or a 12 month analytic outsourcing contract will perhaps uh, characterize for that but i would say that uh, that's under 10% if you want to see the annuity character uh, kra is the best example where once i have let's say a base of 2 crore pans these individuals can go and open accounts anywhere but the exchange of the pan information or the kyc information that i store is revenue accretive so theoretically even if i stop selling uh, for a day or a month uh, that revenue continues similarly if you see uh, camps rep and you see the insurance policies that we have on the base uh, they continue to be revenue accretive because we continue charging an amc even if theoretically i were to stop selling for some time uh, so a similar trajectory go through in payments for example if i have let's say a few crore sips in the base those sips have to be triggered every month or every week if i theoretically stop selling to new clients or stop onboarding new sips that that remains in the base so the project based non annuity sell 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 revenue which i would characterize it as not more than 10 to 15% the rest of it is base revenue once you brought a logo in and once you matched up these basic metrics Yes, most of it is not AUM related. Most of it will be transaction related, but those transactions are so recurring in nature, and the prices are fixed that uh, I see it as annual revenue. Got it. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, <clears throat> I think Ram mentioned a couple of times uh, on the account aggregator business, uh, something like a you know reworking of the platform. Uh, so if you could you know talk a little more about it, because I I thought I mean. this was anyways uh, sort of a fresh investments that has happened uh, in the past couple of years so um from a from a monetization point of view or from a you know revenue accrual margin point of view um do we see this platform sort of the monetization getting right shifted uh, because of whatever investments that are happening 
So, uh, let me clarify. So, what I meant was, you know, with the several use cases and onboarding of various customers, we are just kind of making changes in the platform which will make it easier to onboard new customers. And there will obviously be a rationalization of code as we go along in terms of scalability, in terms of capability. Uh, so, it's not as if we are taking and thrashing the platform and building a new platform. I think uh, it's more kind of an enhancement that we do and make it more efficient to keep onboarding or adding, you know, for, for us currently to take a customer goal line is when things start getting interesting. Sign-ups are okay, but go live is when we start getting revenue. So this entire go live process with all the disparate IT systems of so many people would require some amount of uh, reorientation from a platform perspective. That's what I was mentioning. And uh, it was in the context of, you know, why further investments would be made in these. I think that was the question. So in that context, I was saying that this could be what we are doing. However, we don't intend thrashing the platform, building a new platform and all the things. It's a cloud-based scalable platform that we have. We continue to enhance that platform. Uh, and there is no, uh, in fact, we are at a very interesting place from a monetization perspective. The rates are sort of stable. Uh, the sign-ups are happened, and now the go live is happening for various customers. Use cases are evolving. So there's no asset change in the model of monetization or the trajectory that we foresee from monetization. Uh, we have grown 100% quarter on quarter, and there's nothing that prevents us from uh, repeating that fleet in the next few quarters. So uh, it's in a good, sh good shape now. Uh, the usual investments will continue to happen in tweaking the platform and making it more efficient for onboarding. Got it. That's helpful. Uh, one couple of, again, uh, smaller uh, data point questions. Uh, uh, would you have the period and AUM handy by any chance, um, overall and equity? Oh, period end. Uh, so can I can I just refer that and get back to you, uh, the period and AUM? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it was on an increasing trajectory. If your question is, is it going to sustain, I think yeah. uh, the AMPI numbers will show that uh, the average AUM is much less than the period closing AUM, if that's your question. But I'll get back to the exact number. No problem. No problem. And then one more, uh, again, sort of a clarification. When I look at the um, non-NF revenue breakup for AIF particularly, the, 22, the, 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 the 21% number uh, seems to be higher than, you know, what we get when calculating the number using the you know the mix that you've disclosed i think the calculated number seems to be somewhere around you know 14 15 percent so no no uh, so i'll just clarify so in from our perspective uh you know the segment is aaf uh we will probably make a change in the presentation so feed people also does uh, service to the same segment uh, so that put together is the 21 percent that we are talking about uh, understood understood uh, and then last one is that uh, under insurance repository, the EIA uh, piece that you mentioned, uh, that that uh, that's not I mean, that doesn't make money, right? Uh, it's the no. the other piece, um, which uh, which is where you make uh, revenues on a per policy basis, right? So uh, I'll just take a minute. Uh, yes, uh, on a on a on a margins basis. Uh, I think the entire insurance repository business is close to break even. It's not making money. And the insurance repository, which is your EAA account and the per policy billing that we do, is not at a critical stage where it's starting to make money. That is accurate. Uh, the other so other business uh, which we have in the, uh, is the outsourcing business, which is a more uh, pure outsourcing kind of a play where we do some policy servicing, persistency, calling, feet on street, etc. Uh, and the implant of resources. So that's the thing that is kind of making a small margin. But uh, the EAA uh, segment, which is which is the AMC for the policies that we have, the policy conversion charges that we have, and the transaction charges that we have, currently is not making money. And that's where we're looking to the Bima Central platform, which will which should already started integration with a couple of three of three of the insurers, and one has gone live. Uh, by April first, when that's kind of a little more rounded in terms of an offering and transaction start going in. We hope to kind of see break even and start making money from the first quarter of next year. Got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is from the line of Santosh Keshri from Keshri Finance. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So I have two questions. One is about um, uh, one question and one solution actually. So the question is about EIA business uh, and uh, your uh, um, alternative business. So if you can uh, share with us what is the total addressable market that we are trying to handle in terms of uh, two years down the line, three years down the line, it would be very helpful uh, in valuing this uh, business. 
that's one. And secondly, in terms of tradition, I have this that uh, now that the camps has lot of businesses, uh, if you can share uh, data points along these businesses in the PowerPoint itself, in the presentation that you have, wherein uh, the profitability of the different businesses and the operating drivers are also placed, it will be very helpful in terms of consistency of the information that is coming from your team. And uh, we be able to, uh, you know, look up quarter to quarter, year to year, what is the progress. Okay. Uh, so, from a EIA perspective, uh, think of it that uh, and you you've seen in the past uh, some statements made by regulators of there being a compulsory GMAT regime uh, potentially to be ushered into insurance. That is when the entire effect of uh, EIA and uh, you know uh, electronic policies will will kind of play out. Uh, that count of policies in the country is close to 55 crore, which means if you want to look at the base of business which at one time could accrue to insurance repositories, that's about 55 crore policy. What accrues to them today is about 3 crore, so that's about 5% of potential, which means the balance 95% has not been realized. Uh, also, the fact that because uh, it has not become as popular as it could have, uh, and, and the level of integration with insurance companies, etc., is what it is. Uh, one's ability to transact, which is to to either select a new policy or to make a claim or to pay premiums or to look at a single screen and look at all your maturity values, etc., it isn't where it is, and that is why the transaction revenue has also not kicked in. So that market is potentially a 15 to 20x market compared to what you're seeing today. Uh, take it with a pinch of salt that uh, as a normal consumer movement, it has been going at a certain pace, uh, making it mandatory at a regulatory industry level will have a completely different impact. Uh, when will it happen? Uh, we can all collectively guess. So that's one. Okay. EIS on the other side, uh, have been significantly embracing outsourcing. Uh, you will see that from a total registered count perspective, there are almost a thousand AIS in the country. Everybody may not have launched. We service about 200 of them. Uh, a lot of them may have outsourced uh, or may have bought outsourcing services only for onboarding and TA kind of services. Uh, now, of course, you know that DMAT has become mandatory, so that and then fund accounting and other fund administration services. I would still say that uh, the non-outsource part is still uh, quite large. It is sitting there. Most of the new funds when they get launched are getting launched in a captive manner, which means that they are right then not coming to us till they scale to, let's say, beyond 100 investors or beyond a critical mass. So that, again, from an outsource versus non-outsource revenue perspective, you can say that we perhaps touched less than 50% of what is out there. Most of the large AIFs, of course, have outsourced, so they are customers. But uh, there is a significant number, several hundreds of them, which can potentially become clients over the coming years. That's really the addressable market for you. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. And uh, regarding my suggestion on uh, uh, giving information in a tabular format for different businesses in the power. Yeah, uh, so, uh, thanks, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. So, what we will give a tabular format of the revenue and uh, uh, the other part of it, we will definitely have a look at it sir, at the end of this quarter. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much and wish you all good success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Ram Charan for closing comments. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tushar, and uh, thank you for the participation and continued interest in CAMS. Uh, we appreciate your time spent on this, and for any clarification, please reach out to our IR agency, Odin Capital, or Anish Savlani, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Once again, thanks for your time. On behalf of Computer Age Management Services Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.